There is more and more information coming out now that suggests that this virus is one, man-made, and two, it, it's appearing more and more likely that it does tie to this P4 research lab in Wuhan, right by the epicenter of this virus. The first case, December 1st, the first one we know about, had nothing to do with this live food market, which was the original claim of the Chinese Communist Party, that it came from this, you know, people eating bats or something like that at this wild food market. That narrative is proven false. We know two things. One is, you, those of you who saw our episode with uh, Hung He, you can watch it in our video list if you're interested. Uh, he spoke about the sequence of this virus and that the shell, essentially the outer part of the virus, is a 100% match to a bat coronavirus, which is in the you know, virus database, submitted by the Chinese military in Nanjing province. In other words, the it has part of a virus, a 100% match to a bat coronavirus sub uh, su submitted by the Chinese military to this database. The other part of it, the spikes, the things that make this virus human transmittable, appear to come from the SARS virus. And of course, in 2015, researchers at the P4 research lab in Wuhan, this is again the, say, highest level security virus research lab, you can, you know, in terms of technical definitions about the, the highest level of dangerous viruses you can possibly have. This research lab came out in 2015, published papers saying that they had successfully altered a bat coronavirus to become human transmittable. We have with us Jeff Nyquist. He's an author. He's, an, he's a researcher. He's an expert on the history of uh, Soviet weapons programs. Former Defense Minister Chi Hao Chen gave a speech uh, it appears to be a speech with uh, party cadre at a very high level uh, sometime after the year 2000, but before he left office in 2003. Um, uh, the speech was translated by Epoch Times in uh, 2005 and published. That's when I first saw it. The speech is very unusual because he begins by talking about a uh, survey that they conducted online, uh, an opinion survey of Chinese people. And they wanted to know whether or not Chinese people would uh, go along with the killing of prisoners, uh, women and children, civilians uh, in, in large numbers. And uh, he expressed uh, great satisfaction with the survey because 80% of the respondents said that that it was okay with them if prisoners of war and civilians were killed uh, in a war, basically. And at first he said, well, this means that uh, our soldiers will kill their soldiers in a war, but it also means that, uh, you know, if we have to take really ruthless measures, uh, people will not object, will not have a problem. If 20% of people object, it's not so bad that we can't deal with that. Um, that was sort of how the speech began. And then he said, well, why do we want to talk about this? And he said, because China has this severe problem. China is overpopulated. The Chinese economy will not grow indefinitely. There will be inevitably a recession within the Chinese economy. And if the Chinese economy should fail, if the population is no longer sustained on the land, and there, was, uh, there could be a revolution against the Communist Party, uh, and then we will be all uh, uh, hanged as criminals uh, and we must uh, justify the rule of the Communist Party by teaching the Chinese people to go out. And what he meant by that was to gain new land and uh, with this new land create a second China that they could move hundreds of millions of people to, uh, to alleviate the population, overpopulation pressures on the land of China. And of course he talked about, well, if we could get land in Taiwan or land in India or even Japan or Southeast Asia, it would be trivial because the Americans would block us. The Americans would rush to the defense of whoever we attack to take their land and we would end up in a war with America. So he said, besides uh, what we need is land like they have in North America. And he said, what we need is America's land. 
So since we have to fight America, uh, essentially, we might as well take their land. But how do you do this fight against America, Australia, Canada? How do you take this larger land uh, that is not trivial, he said, in what it would amount to for making a new China? He said, we have to learn how to clean up uh, America with biological weapons because we can't have a nuclear war because a nuclear war, we would destroy China and we would destroy North America and we would not end up with new land. So we need to be able to have a war that leaves the land intact and that does not destroy the, the buildings and the structures, but that allows us to just move in and, and repopulate the land. And that's biological warfare. Well, just to talk about Xi, he's not just another general. He was the defense minister, which means he's at a policymaking level. Uh, also on the party military commission again, at a very high level within the political structure. So he is not just simply a general. But the reason, when I first saw the speech, uh, I didn't, I, I thought this can't be true. That was, I think it's everybody's reaction to hearing about such a fantastic speech, uh, and fantastic I mean by hard to believe, that somebody would talk like this. Um, even referring to himself as a humanitarian communist uh, and saying what a shame it is to have to kill, you know, 200 million Americans or whatever to 300 million Americans. Um, I had done some work uh, 20 years ago plus with a Russian defector named Colonel Stanislav Lunev. And Lunev had, uh, was familiar with war plans. He spoke fluent Mandarin. He'd worked in China. He had uh, involvement with uh, uh, involvements with China that the uh, Russian military had. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a meeting in Moscow of generals, and he being a high, very high-level colonel, who was at one time military briefer for uh, Gorbachev. Uh, he understood they had an intelligence treaty they had signed secret treaty with China to share all intelligence on North America. But they also had an agreement about a, a war, a future war that they were planning. The, one of the first things the generals had said to him is that the nuclear war plan against America is still viable, only we are not going to provide um, uh, troops for invading the lower 48 states. China is going to provide the invasion force. And of course, the, the conception of a nuclear war is a, it's, a, it's a strike against America's nuclear weapons. So that doesn't mean you're bombing cities. doesn't mean you're polluting the environment. It means uh, very localized nuclear attacks like you had at Hiroshima and Nagasaki where specific military targets are struck in the United States for uh, disarming purposes uh, against naval ships and whatnot. But... Um, What's really interesting is Lunev then said that they had made a deal with China to, uh, in the arrangement of territory, they, Russia, was going to invade and get Alaska and parts of Canada, and that the rest was going to go to China with other countries invited in for looting rights. Now, there's a part in this speech, and it's very passing, and Xi makes no big deal about it, but he says, that they had made an agreement with the Russians to trade land in the north for what they needed, which was the lower 48 states and whatever parts of Canada, China were going to get. Well, this is exactly lines up with what Lunev told me. In the Chi Hao Chen speech, we, we made an agreement with Russia to trade land in the north, he says, for what we, for the land we need, which was the lower 48 states and whatever you know, I, I, I'm unclear on w what parts of Canada that they would get. Uh, you know, probably places where Chinese are already living, I don't know. He also mentioned the possible necessity of killing Chinese in North America um, because they would not be adaptable to their party system. The speech is very long and it's very technical. And because I suddenly, you know, perked up and said, wow, how could he have known this detail? How could this be in the speech if it wasn't authentic? I studied the speech in greater detail. 
And my knowledge, I have studied the, the Soviet military thinking, their classics, their books, their ways of waging war. And I know that a lot of those translate over to the Chinese because the Chinese were trained in part by the Russians back in the 1950s after the communist regime came to power. And many of the concepts are similar. For example, we have a division between nuclear and conventional, but they have no division. Everything that is needed and necessary in the right uh, context will be used. Uh, they have no moral uh, scruples about what kind of weapon they will use. Um, it is all about the victory uh, of communism. And of course, um, uh, nuclear weapons in the, and biological weapons as used by the Soviets, they regard, the Soviets also regarded biological weapons as m potentially more powerful than nuclear weapons in terms of killing large numbers of people. In fact, they saw the way to depopulate an enemy, not in terms of nuclear weapons, but in terms of the use of biological weapons, and not just one biological weapon, but multiple different kinds of biological weapons at one time. And also the combination in some areas of biological weapons and the effects of radiation, where radiation lowers the immune system and then the biological weapon finishes off the person. Now the Russians now publicly, very strangely, have a first strike policy, which they admit they will be the first to use nuclear weapons. During the Cold War, they did not, however, although their doctrine was to use nuclear weapons first. Um, the, the Russians would make, a, the Soviets, when before the fall of the Soviet Union, they'd make a big deal about, oh, we would never nu use nuclear weapons first, but that was their whole strategy, to use nuclear weapons first if it came to a war. Famously, the defector Viktor Suvorov said, um, the American view of nuclear weapons was ridiculous, that, that if you're, uh, let's say you're a guy in the old wild west wearing a gun, this is the analogy Suvorov made, you're wearing a gun, but you're going to go to fisticuffs and start throwing chairs before you pull your gun. And he said, that's ridiculous. You pull your gun first and you shoot your enemy dead with your first shot. Um, so it's, uh, their view was that uh, surprise also. Lunev underscored this to me, that the operational thinking of both the Russians and Chinese, if it's going to come to a war, the most important element for winning a war with modern weapons is surprise. And you will note the speed with which ballistic missile weapons operate. You can fire a ballistic missile weapon for Q from Cuba, for example, and it can reach Washington in four minutes. You can fire a ballistic missile weapon from a submarine uh, off the coast of the U.S., and you've got a flight time of under two minutes. So w we're talking about uh, tremendous speed of surprise attack today, where, which would make the attack on Pearl Harbor seem like a slow motion affair where a fleet has to ply its way across the Pacific and get within a range of relatively short-range carrier aircraft. No, we're talking about very fast weapons launched from you know, platforms underwater or in areas close, land areas close to the United States. Um, and this is what they're talking about. There's also, Lunev spoke of pre-positioning nuclear and biological weapons in the United States before an attack. Uh, where they would smuggle. Uh, uh, narcotic smuggling was a very big thing for the Russians and the Chinese engaged in narcotic smuggling. And those same routes where they had uh, bribed officials and they could clear through the border what they could get, they would bring in um, nuclear and um, biological weapons and chemical weapons, toxic weapons, and they would uh, cite them. For example, Lunev had to, when he worked for the GRU in the United States, find places to store these weapons. Places, for example, with uh, a lot of people don't know this, nuclear weapons need a constant source of electricity. Hmm. Uh, the, you, you have to keep them plugged in, so to speak, to keep them fresh. So um, they had to find places for these nuclear weapons to be stored where they could keep them uh, on, uh, you know, uh, plugged into an electrical source. Uh, and then they would store them for the purpose of, you know, bringing them out at wartime so that they could have a nuclear weapon inside of an American city or up to an American military target and detonate it without any sign of a missile coming. Um, and with biological weapons, of course, very important to distribute them 
uh, into the population in various means. For example, uh, crop dusters, drones, uh, you know, you take a crop duster. The Russians had a method of attack which they developed called polar outbreak, which was to take a biological agent, mill it down to 0.5 milligrams, and then um, uh, distribute it in a cloud, a cold air mass. Cold air masses are stable. They move at 20 miles an hour. Uh, it's the perfect speed for delivery of the agent. And they determined that one third of the people in the path of a seated cold air mass would contract the illness if it was anthrax, bubonic plague, or smallpox. Those were the three main uh, weaponized agents uh, mass produced by the Russians during the Cold War, uh, those three. Uh, it's interesting that only of those three, only smallpox is really uh, contagious. Not as much, by the way, as the flu or the coronavirus. Uh, smallpox is less contagious. Uh, and bubonic plague requires a, a, a insect vector, a fleas on rats. Um, that's a little more difficult trick to do. But if you see the cold air mass and people breathe it, it's just like being injected into the lung because, as I recall, we breathe about five or six gallons of air a minute. And so you breathe it, it reaches the lung, it's just as if you got an injection of the of the virus or the bacteria in the case of bubonic plague and anthrax. Now, now this, this uh, Soviet era plan to inject cold, uh, cold air masses with biological weapons. Where, did, where was this written at in terms of these documents? This, well, this appeared in General Rothschild's book. General Rothschild was the head of the American, one of the chiefs of the American Biological War Pro Warfare Program in the late 50s, early 60s. Rothschild wrote a book called um, New Weapons, New Wars, I think was the title of the book, um, in which he talked about the polar outbreak attack method of seeding uh, cold air masses in Upper Canada uh, with uh, transport planes that the Russians could uh, bring into the region. And the cold air mass, the large cold air masses, they're so large that they would cover all of uh, North America uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. So we're talking about a cold air mass that comes down from Canada, fills up the whole U.S. and enter and leaves through the the Gulf and the Atlantic seaboard with a thousand feet. He said it's a, these air masses are normally three thousand feet thick, and they would they would go into the Atlantic with a thousand feet left, and they would be dropping those particles in the air over the area. And of course, uh, the most at that time he was writing, the most uh, uh, powerful biological weapon was thought to be anthrax, which is not of course contagious, but if you see the cold air mass and a third of the people breathe it is like 98% fatal uh, unless you prophylactically take a lot of antibiotic before you come down with symptoms you're probably going to die. With viruses like flus um, uh, and smallpox for example, smallpox I believe is a virus too, uh, the advantage of them is that you can create vaccines and if you have a vaccine and you can introduce that vaccine to your own population then you are inoculated from it. Uh, for example, uh, soldiers from North Korea to this day that defect across the DMZ are found to have antibodies for smallpox, a disease that was wiped out, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, so uh, how do they have this uh, antibodies to smallpox? They've been vaccinated, but not against ordinary smallpox. They've been vaccinated against the weaponized form of smallpox that the Russians developed during the Cold War and that the North Koreans possess as a weapon. So, in other words, if North Korea, if the Korean War should happen, they would use smallpox on their enemy, but they would want to make sure that that smallpox doesn't come back on them. So they inoculate their own people, their own troops. Um, uh, that's an example. So, for example, there's a big, in developing a weapon, therefore a viral weapon, there's a number of stages. In order to develop a vaccine, you would have to first develop the weapon. And so, and it could be that what we're looking at in the coronavirus, although we don't know, of course, is that it's an intermediate stage. That is, they're, tr they're, they're experimenting with making such viruses go human to human, and they're also experimenting with making them more virulent 
I, uh, I'm not sure we yet know what the virulency of this virus is. But if you look, um, the Russian literature and the American literature discussing it discusses that some uh, illnesses are more important because the illness, not because the illness kills everyone, but because the illness makes people sick. And that for every uh, seriously ill person, it takes uh, more than two or more people to take care of them right? Whether that's whether they're at home or whether they're uh, in a hospital, especially if they're very desperately ill. And of course, what, what we've read about the, the, uh, the COVID-19 virus, now they're calling this uh, novel coronavirus 2019, is that 17% uh, of the people that become ill with it become seriously ill with it, that they need uh, medical attention, that they need oxygen, uh, is one of the reports I've read. And of course, this takes up hospital resources. Also, uh, because of the exposure, a high level of medical personnel become infected. And you can see about the quarantine in China, how disruptive of a society a virus like this can be. It can disrupt the economy. It can disrupt the government. You know, I mean, they've canceled a major government meeting here in China. Uh, it, can, it can be enormously disruptive. So, for example, when you use a biological weapon, you might use a precursor weapon like this so that there's suddenly this outbreak and that there's suddenly these social disruptions and economic disruptions. And then you can, this virus might also have a negative effect on the immune system of the people that had it. For example, uh, when I was one years old, I got German measles. It was just before they got the shot for German measles. And uh, now I'm immune to German measles for the rest of my life, but my immune system was affected by the German measles so that I got every cold, every virus that came all around when I was a kid until I was about seven or eight years old. Um, so uh, the properties, the effects of the infection, you're talking with uh, COVID-19 with uh, people who are hospitalized for up to three weeks. Uh, we're talking about an illness that lays can lay people flat. Uh, even if 82% of the people that get it or 83% of the people that get it, uh, it's just like a, a cold. Uh, uh, for that large of a percentage of people to be disabled, uh, even for a couple of weeks could be militarily decisive because that's going to also go through the enemy's military. Imagine a 17% of your military is down with something. Uh, and then you have quarantine, uh, disruptive quarantine measures in effect. You can imagine the advantage this one potential weapon could have, but also they may not be done. If it was a weapon, they may not be done with increasing its virulency. They may still yet be trying to develop a way to make that percentage of those dying or ill higher. Uh, 